And there's the mic sign. Welcome back once again to Legends of the Drowned Isles, a homebrew D&D 5th Ed campaign. This is Campaign 2, The Great Confusion. Born out of necessity in the year 2020, and then seems to be more aptly named every time I return back to my notes. Uh, I'm your host, I'm the GM, I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One. Uh, I created the world of Omatia for my players to play in, and so far... They have been doing so. Starting on my left. <laughs> What's that? We haven't, haven't destroyed, destroyed it yet. yet. Well, you know, there's always time. Until, of course, everything is destroyed. Then there's no more time. Starting on my left with my players, uh, which is sad. So I guess technically my right. I don't know how directions work when you're facing cameras. Welcome, Pat. Hi, my name is Pat. I play Silas uh the cultist of mother hydra also currently hangry as heck why why have i never said hail hydra i really should have uh hi my name is marie and i am playing annie who i forget what level of hunger i am <laughs> well, i might want to double check i believe that. i am i believe i am whatever the second one was second one was hangry I think Silas is up to the third one. Hangry. Hey, I'm Nax, and I'm playing Medric, half orc cleric, who is not very clerical right now because I have no spell points or spell slots left. And I forget if I'm hungry or hangry. One of the two. <laughs> so Those I dead believe, hyenas look mighty fine right now. I believe that you were only hungry. But you yeah. are somewhat exhausted, I think, as well. Right. There was right, a couple right, of things yeah. working against you, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, Medric was was hungry, Annie was hangry, and Silas was famished. What does all that mean? Well, it means we should do a little recap here to give people up to date about what happened. After being attacked by strange, ravenous gnolls, the group, along with Veer, used the two surviving creatures to lead them to a being they refer to as the Laughing One. As they traveled deeper into the forest, the gnolls became more agitated, forcing the group to eliminate one of them. Soon, the entire group noticed a change in their surroundings. Outwardly, the area felt close and changing, with trees that seemed to be drained of life and color and twisting in odd ways, and the light shifted too. A yipping howl rang through the area, and the remaining knoll returned it. Inwardly, they could feel a growing hunger that was, at times, uncontrollable. They knew they must be getting close. Soon they came upon a deep bowl in the earth. To one side, a large pile of stones led to a cave. Knolls hissed and growled at each other around a fire. It looked as though they had two humanoid captives, too, bound tightly by rope. A fight broke out but the group quickly subdued the few knolls that were outside. More could be heard coming, and they began to search the area. Silas entered the cave, but discovered a terrifying being. It seemed like a gigantic, skinless knoll, nearly twice the size of the others. In its chest, a gnarly-toothed mouth split a terrible grin. It stalked out from the cave, barely concerning itself with the invaders. The fight continued. More knolls arrived. It was close but the four of them managed to overcome them. When the large, demonoid knoll died, it seemed to relieve the area of its awful presence, and the other knolls fled off into the woods. Now, however, a gnawing fe feeling still churned in the pit of their stomachs, but they turned themselves toward the task of recovering whatever the gruesome knolls had hidden. For the mother had urgently spoken to Silas during the fight. She spoke of a presence she yearned for, a door of some kind, either to be brought to her or for her to be taken to it. And with some urgency, they searched. So, what do you find? Outside, there's not much. The gnolls themselves don't seem to have any sort of proper weaponry. The, for lack of a better word, enhanced gnolls that have these scar-like coverings on their bodies that seem to have mystical symbols are wearing a little bit more in terms of uh, hides that were a little less crudely put together, but nothing of real value. 
In the cave, however, as you start to look around, uh, by the way, too, you do have uh, a couple of people with you. Uh, you have these two um, two people. I think one of them was knocked unconscious, and the other one uh, was merely uh, uh, knocked down. Um, a, uh, a woman, a female half-elf. Yeah, she's currently down. I think she was knocked unconscious. Uh, and the other uh, male... Um, human, but who has traits of half-elf, uh, probably distantly related to a half-elf. Both of them are kind of twisting a bit on the ground. Each of you do feel that continuing pulse of pain in your stomachs, although Veer seems unaffected by it and is watching each of you cautiously. You each see each other and see these two and realize that unconsciously, you're baring your teeth a little bit more. You're grimacing a little bit more strongly than you might have realized. And maybe, just maybe, every once in a while, you have to wipe away some, some spittle, some saliva. As you look around and disturbingly, the dead bodies of the gnolls seem really, really tasty. And there's a fire in there. We could probably cook them. There is. Um, I forgot to buy snacks when I went grocery shopping, y'all. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is always a danger when I start describing food of any kind, even in a bad way, because everybody starts to get hungry, including me. However, uh, you spend some time uh, searching around the area. Uh, one thing that Silas had noted in the cave before, uh, before the fight broke out again, was that there were a large number of bones inside. It didn't seem to be animal bones. And it did seem to be the most fruitful possibility for where you might find some things. I've presumed, I guess, at this point, that you've also untied the two prisoners who had been tied up by these uh, folks. Crude sort of ropes that probably were stolen. Um, Silas is in the cave. He's obsessed. Yeah. Patrick will also go in the cave. Maybe there's food in there. Because there's none out here. Um, Unless the two civilians count. But Veer's, like, giving me the dirty look, and I don't think they count. Yeah. Veer's well, kind also, of looking I... them over and trying to figure out if she can do much, because she doesn't seem to have much healing skill. Uh, also, last session, Veer was affected. She was at Hungry. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. She, wa- she wasn't any higher than that, I don't think. All right. But, uh, yeah. She's going to uh, pause there and, and pull out some, some, some supplies of her own and eat those pretty rapidly, trying to fend off the hunger. Uh, Veer, you're a good hunter, right? I have been known to hunt, yes. I Uh, I haven't done so recently. Any chance you can get us a deer? Or a moose? Or a hippopotamus? There's a fire, we can cook it. Um, (laughs) She kind of puzzles her her face at the word hippopotamus, but... uh, (laughs) Uh, looks at you, and she, you can see her also um, kind of doing the calculation, sort of weighing the the, the bodies that are around them, uh, even having cut the rope free from this uh, this male human in front of her, sort of looking at him, her licking her lips a little bit more intently than she thought, uh, and the remains of the crumbs that she had in the wrapped up package that she uh, carefully sort of siphons into her mouth. I can try. I feel strange, distracted, but yes, I will, I will find something. Will you be Much staying here? Yes, we're going to just look to see if there's anything we can use. It I seems... thought that by killing the laughing one, we wouldn't be hungry anymore. It seems as though the place is returning to normal. The trees seem to return to healthiness, but this internal hunger remains but I, I feel it go. too please be safe you too and with that she kind of turns and heads off into the woods uh, pulling out her bow and within a few seconds she's almost impossible to see and you're not sure exactly if you could follow her or even find her at this point Inside the cave, Silas, you find yourself kind of digging through the well-gnawed bones of numerous 
uh, definitely humanoids um, that have been captured and caught. You think back to some of the attacks that have been attributed recently and people gone missing and realize that this may have been one of the reasons. Although the area you're in right now is not uh, connected to some of the other places, it would be a long journey for them, for example, to head towards the lighthouse where you did see uh, or did have a missing courier that you'd run across at one point uh, and a horse that had been uh, slaughtered as well. Um, within this, um, you do find scraps of clothing. Um, many of them seem to have been torn by teeth. But looking closely, some of them definitely have been stretched until they tore rather than ripped and torn apart. Uh, the bones are not piled in any particular way. But among them, you do find a few uh, nod, but uh, still uh, solid pouches of money um, from this small number of victims. Piling them together, probably haphazardly. It's not food. It's not. It's clearly not what the mother was asking for. But overall, um, it's it's uh, two amounts of small money is basically when you pile it all together. Um, something catches your eye, um, buried among. Uh, one of the the, uh, the hands, essentially, uh, or worn around one of the hands. Uh, the teeth around it, or the sorry, the the fingers around uh, a ring. Um, you can see that uh, the the hands themselves were gnawed at very very vigorously. Small amount of flesh still stuck within the ring as you as you gently pull it off. Uh, the ring itself seems untarnished. It is a silver ring quite broad, actually, um, and you realize that the hands you're pulling it from were shorter but broader. Uh, it appears to have some sort of family crest on the top. It looks like the shape of an eye, and in the center of the eye is a clear gem. Um, it has a, a certain amount of weight to it as well, surprising for its size. Um, and while, again, the fingers around this had been gnawed, um, that doesn't seem to have been affected. Um, not yeah. far. Sorry. Uh, Silas is going to press to digitate the ring clean. Okay. Uh, Cause that's gross. <laughs> uh, tasty, but gross. Well, you were going to eat worse earlier. But... <laughs> no, he's kept himself from eating anything. Um, uh, yeah, I would uh, need sorry. you to make a wisdom saving throw, though, because you're still in the throes of, of, of uh, famished. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you managed to sort of use the magic to, to shove away the, the flesh without having to touch it. And uh, it, it feels... There's a momentary temptation that also kind of churns your stomach at the same time. Because the flesh, whatever had been left behind, was was clearly kind of rotting and and uh, falling away. Um, the the ring itself had prevented uh, very hungry teeth from getting into the the uh, the flesh. Um, I'm assuming you set the set the ring aside for the moment. Uh, he'd pocket it. Okay. Yeah. Um, not far from there, you also see something which at first you take to be a stone, but a, a squared off edge um, causes you to have a double look. And when you pull some of the bones away, you notice a square box of stone, essentially. It is about four inches on a side. It does seem to be a, a, a perfect cube. It seems to be very, very carefully made. Smooth, um, but with a, um, where are we here? Uh, with a, oh, I gotta scroll, pardon me. Um, with a, a intricate um, pattern on the very top in inlaid quartz. Um, the, the, it's very heavy for its size, uh, even being only a few inches on the side. Um, you get the impression that it's not necessarily solid stone, but awfully close. On the top, there seems to be a round uh, sigil. Where are we here? Uh, that's weird. I know I wrote it out. Oh, well. I have to do it from memory. Um, it is a round sigil, um, so a circle, and within the circle, there seem to be three curves. 
um, one curve runs only one third of the uh, sigil inside. The second curve runs about uh, half of the distance around the circumference, and the third one curves almost entirely. Um, at the end of each of these curves is a small um, um, tear-shaped uh, gem that is also embedded within this. Um, for the players who may remember this particular symbol, it is a variation of the symbol of Paluxia, which was a set of crashing waves. Um, but the the uh, player or the characters have no way to really recognize that. Nope. Who is Paluxia? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and finally, the Emer third thing... Emerin fumes in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, fumes and another campaign. Fumes and other campaignish. Um, the third thing you find, not far away from that box, and under some very, very heavy set bones, uh, appears to be a large slab of stone. Um, this one, about nine inches by about uh, twelve inches, um, and then you you realize that it's not a a simple slab of stone, but in fact a a um, stone with a uh, another inlaid uh, design on the front. Uh, the design uh, resembles very much the same as the ring that you just found, and it includes actually a similar um, uh, gem in the center of the eye. Um, and you realize when you kind of heft it up, it's quite heavy, uh, but it actually, in fact, looks to be a bound book. Um, as you flip it a little bit, you notice that most of the pages have been torn out or, in fact, if you're more uh, more accurate about it, look like they've been gnawed out. But there do appear to be a few remaining pages. Uh, or is it... Uh, do I notice if it's in common, draconic, or abyssal? It does not appear to be any of those, but from the squarish writing you see on the inside of the front cover, um, it does resemble dwarvish. Mm. Hey, dwarf fish. I read all common languages in okay. the the kingdom. <laughs> all right. uh, yeah, Silas will clean that off, and then wherever Annie is inside or outside the uh, cave, uh, he'll toss it towards her. I'd uh, probably he's... be inside helping. Uh, yeah, he uh, and he's going through the wreckage like a madman, uh, throwing food. things around and um, not looking for food. He's tossing food out of the way. Uh, <laughs> he's looking for something else. Is, is it obvious? Or because I'm assuming after talking to Veer, I'd be in the cave as well. Uh, it's not. A, it wouldn't be obvious what he's looking for, but it's definitely not food because there's lots of dead people pieces in there, and he's not snacking. Um, he might be looking for non-people food. Uh, that would probably make sense, uh, but um, but he hasn't said what he's actually looking for yet. Okay. Um, I was mistaken because I wrote out the descriptions, and then I realized I wrote them out in Roll Twenty, um, and. Uh, on the outside of the cover of the book actually is where the same carved circular sigil sits as was on the box or on the cube. Uh, and on the inside is where you see the, uh, the uh, sigil of the eye uh, as well. What else did I write about this? It seems to have had a place for a strap and possibly a lock, but nothing remains but leather scraps. I went through all the process of writing this. Now I'm not going to read it. Yes, of course I am. There are signs of wearing around the stone brackets, which seem to be marks of cloth, claw and tooth. Uh, the inside of the front cover has an inscription carefully and artfully carved into it in the unmistakable, if archaic, boxy writing of the dwarves. It appears to be a dedication. At the bottom, there is a square symbol which surrounds a silver, silver inlaid oval, a stylized eye, eye uh, perhaps a family crest. Um, the book could have once held dozens, if not hundreds, of thin, rough vellum paper, paper which is made from animal hide. But most of the paper, papers, uh, pages seem to be torn out roughly. Red stains line the rest, deeply sunk into the surface of the paper. 
Uh, there are a number of pages which have readable writing on them and a few pages with diagrams of a round device and labels drawn from some, uh, from some of its parts. Uh, as the pages go on, the writing becomes increasingly erratic until at last there is little more than scratches made in red, dark red streaks that often cut through the paper. So I'll actually share um, the, uh, the handout so everybody gets a chance to see it. It'll be called cool. The Stone Covered Journal. Um, so that's that one. And then uh, as, Annie, you're taking a look at this and you read uh, Dwarven, I will also show you the translated version, which actually has the, the translations of each of the segments, but I'll read them out loud for, for uh, each of you as well as for the, the folks who might be watching along at home. It is a little bit difficult because the, the uh, language does feel archaic, um, but as you look at it, it's not that it is actually archaic Dwarven. It's that at the, at the, as, as, it, as it begins, it's more like it was uh, uh, trying to be more official. And for you, it, it sort of feels very reminiscent of some of the documents your parents would have made to rule the kingdom. That sort of need to touch back on the ancient uh, touchstones of, of uh, language, to make things sound more official by using fancier words and, and extra syllables that you really don't need anymore. The beginning dedication uh, inside the front cover, written in, in the archaic style, but incredible Dwarven squ square script. In other words, very, very well made and carved into the surface of the stone uh, inside. It says, To Gorfrir Riverforge, may you find the flow of stone. And it is signed by Under King Goldotter, Master of Argenti Sagax. And in that, um, Annie, one of the things you take a little bit aback is the term underking. This was the traditional uh, description or traditional sort of self-title of the dwarven kings of old. And inside of your kingdom, they all submitted to your parents, and to the rather to the kingdom that is your parents' kingdom. It's actually a couple of generations back, as you recall. There should be no under underkings. So either this is really old or someone has declared themselves an under king, and that could mean political disaster as far as the kingdom goes. If the dwarves revolt against the kingdom, it cuts off the kingdom's supply of ore. They are very well suited to being defended for themselves and could be a, 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 a very bad future. That's the dedication. Um... The opening paragraph, written in a measured hand, again in the archaic style of Dwarven. I am excited to begin my search for the portal. It is hard to believe that, after so many years, such a thing might finally be within our grasp. The compass is very complex, and it will take me quite a while to figure it out. Later on, towards the middle of the book, a partial page, the handwriting seems somewhat rushed. What a puzzle! I once thought that the compass was a way to find the portal, but I think it's more clever than that, and maybe more powerful. I think it is a key. Later on, a, a page written in, in handwriting that has grown much smaller, almost as though they're trying to fit more on the page, or, or something has changed. I am very close. I can sense something. There are others here. I feel strange. I do not know how they found the portal or opened it. It is not how I imagined it to be. It is much more. The door is open, but it leads somewhere else. I have run out of food. Later, a page which is filled with cruder handwriting, no longer trying even to give a precept of using the archaic style and it seems strained it no longer follows straight lines too much pressure is placed on the quill and ink has seeped in leaving spots on the lines the sentences are also shorter pain so hungry fed me meat tasted strange so hungry I change Stomach hurts. Endless laughing. In my head. 
The portal is open, but not to allies. Not what I thought it was. Not one door. Many doors. And finally, on the last page, there are only a cluster of words filling the page. Two words in particular, lost and eat, written repeatedly across it. The ink now is a dark red stain, and the lines look more like scratches than quill marks, occasionally piercing through what's left of the vellum. Changed. Must eat all. Door open. New home. Power. Overwhelming. Lost. Not portal. Nexus. Worlds consumed. Allies. Lost. So, in looking it over, that's what Annie reads. How she translates that, maybe literally to the rest, or how she sums it up or provides her own insight from her um, royal background is up to you, Annie. This is not good. Silas, what are you doing? What are you looking for? What's in the book? Is it like somebody's journal and like drama and stuff? Took a bite of something with peanut butter in it just before you asked. <laughs> oh, you're hungry, are you? <laughs> mm. Whatever happened here caused a lot of damage, but also could have, in a way, helped the kingdom. But also, what are you looking for? They are looking Mother's. for it in this journal. The mother said there was something that I should bring her to, or that I should, I should bring to her so that I can are, bring her to this world. What are they looking for in the journal? And uh, yeah, I'm not sure that's a good idea. Silas kind of looks on furiously. Uh, he doesn't say much, but there's probably a little growl. Silas, if it's what this person was looking for, it's dangerous. I need to know what you're looking for. That is all that she said. There was something here, a way here, a way there. A door? Possibly. That would because, make sense. Because from what this book says would cause overwhelming power and consume the world. Yeah, let's not do that. Actually, Silas would come over and say, what does it say exactly? As he kind of looks at the book, but he doesn't understand any of the letters that are there. I'll read the... Uh, the portal is open, but not to allies. Not what I thought it was. Not one door, many doors. New home, power overwhelming, lost, no portal, nexus, world consumed, allies lost. Is it still open? It I don't know. It does sound like they found something bad. So if you're looking for some sort of portal or door, I have to ask you to stop. <laughs> Apparently, one of the hyenas is still there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Silas is getting a little bit animalistic at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so he goes and pees on a tree that uh, you think he might be a little too far gone. Um, all tools are only as good or bad as those who use them. Was the journal author a good guy or a bad guy? I don't know when this journal is from. That would, that would, excuse me, that would change what I think of that. Is there like a date somewhere? Like I can't read whatever that square writing is. The book refers to an underking. There should be no underkings, not for generations. So either there is 
the dwarves are starting to revolt. Old. Uh, Mark, does it... Like, the page is inside. I mean, they definitely look messed up. Do they look old? Like, do they look 100 years old? Um, uh, in terms of what happens to paper and that sort of thing? Or do they look newer? And are they paper or vellum or... It's it's vellum. Um, and vellum ages fairly well. It doesn't get as brittle necessarily as paper does. Um, but um, if you have an appropriate skill, history would be one. Or if you have a, a paper working or book working skill, you could judge it with that. Oh. I do have history. Yeah, you could roll a history roll on it. As Silas is making this observation, how old is this thing? And you're kind of trying to think and you're trying to ref reflect back on all those weird lessons you were given that you thought, I'm never going to need to know any of this stuff. Why do they keep telling me all this stuff? Yeah, One time I'm, I'm also just looking. The table. I'm up? also looking right, right quick. I do also have a forgery kit proficiency, so. Yeah, you could even test it with your forgery kit if you wanted to take time. I'll I'll take a look at it history wise, and then when we are in a more stable place, I'll look at it. Okay. I'll take a better look at it. A uh, twelve. Twelve. It's really hard to say. Um, some old books preserve pretty well because they're essentially closed and locked up. Um, certainly, there's an older style about all of this. But again, there's that sort of officious nature of the book. So unfortunately, just with a sort of quick glance and thinking back, you're, you're kind of remembering partially the lessons you had about forgery, which is how do I make something look older? What actually does it look like it's when it's older? And this one's too beat up to really tell. The, the worst part, in a way, is the fact that the cover is made of pure stone. And that doesn't age at all. No. Not unless it's put in, like, harsh weather. If you wear it like a hat, then the book will age. I'm thinking more like tombstones. <laughs> yeah, there's some acids. I did some work on that in archaeology. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately right now, you can't really no, tell. I don't know nothing. I don't know. It's too... It sounds either like it's very old... Or it's someone trying to sound more pompous than they are. Hmm. It's, it's a stone-covered book. There's no telling how old stone is. And it's vellum, so it's really, really hard to understand. I'd have to take a closer look at it. And it's not worth my time right now. All I know is that what this person was looking for seems to have been very dangerous. It may be what let that thing in, into this world. Who knows? There are definitely many things out there, not all of whom are as beneficent as the mother. Uh, I agree it's dangerous. I do think we may have to look into it, though. But for now... Uh, we need to make sure the door is closed, first of all. It seems to be, because I... I mean, for now, we need to get out of here. Can I feel like the sign in Ignis again? When the when the effects faded, the light streaming in through the canopy of the trees um, felt natural. Yeah. Does anybody recall exactly what time of day it is? I'm, I've I've seemed to have forgotten myself. Uh, late in the day, that's all I know. So. Yeah, I think I think it is fairly late in the day, given that you were also on the road for a fair amount of that day, and then traipsing through the woods for a fair amount, and then. You're not exactly sure how long you were traipsing through to find this particular uh, den. So we're going to say it's late in the day. So the light is still strong enough to see by, but it is starting to wane. At this point, I think we should get out of here. We seem to have dealt with the danger that is... We can always come back. We currently do have a job to do. Uh, beer is getting us venison. There's a fire. We get it okay. eat before we leave, right? That that would I, I'm fine with that, but we need to get back to our job. I, I think we need yeah. to leave as soon as we can. Uh, at this point, the the male uh, 
prisoner, the male captive, who has basically moved over to the other one, is trying to sort of nurse the woman back uh, to consciousness. She took a nasty. Blow. He's he's conscious again. Did um, I knocked him out? Oh, you knocked him out. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so and she was not. Conscious. What? Yeah. Um. Uh, uh, does Silas believe that there might be anything left in the cave, or has he searched it pretty thoroughly? Um, at this point, he, his frantic search has been pretty thorough. He seems to have found all three of these things in one particular spot. Um, make a make a perception check. All of us? Uh, actually, investigation as as the part of that. No, Silas in particular was looking at at this particular stuff and found. Um, yeah, it's just. Eight. A massive pile of bones at this point but there's nothing of any real value that you've seen and even this stuff was kind of the the rare little bits um there's small bags of half torn money and that sort of thing that you've you've kind of accumulated and thrown off to one side and then the ring that's in your pocket at the moment yeah then uh he'll head outside uh but uh yeah, he, he looks around and he's still kind of got that feral look to him. So he's uh, trying very hard not to look at anything that's made of meat. Unfortunately, there are numerous hyenas and gnolls scattered around this area. Yep, he'll head to the edge of the camp and look outward if necessary. Okay. Is Annie, are Annie and Medrick doing anything in particular in the moment, or we can fast forward to when Veer comes back? Yeah, we're going to wait for Veer. Waiting for Veer, trying to not have, like, hyena barbecue. Okay. <laughs> can I have a wisdom check from all of you? Uh-oh. Wisdom saving throw, I should say. Oh, yeah, I got nice. this. Nice. My rolls are the opposite of the last time. So <laughs> oh, I, I accidentally rolled with advantage there. Or maybe not. What? Huh? Uh, okay. It, it only rolled once. Yep, I only get a 14. Yep. So uh, Annie and Medrick, you're finding it uh, possible to sort of stave off this hunger, um, but Silas, you feel yourself compelled to eat. Um, there's no particular food right near you. You've kind of isolated yourself from, from the, the bodies, but you find yourself staring at them and smelling at them. Uh, and then are you going to go ahead and try to eat or are you going to resist? He hadn't actually eaten his rations yet, I don't think. Okay. Uh, I don't remember what he's got on him. I ate all my pocket baking. That's all I know. Same. <laughs> uh, yeah, he'll scarf down whatever rations he has left, anyways. And okay, so both Annie and Medrick, you see Silas desperately dig into his bag after kind of staring blankly at in towards the the center of the bowl where all these bodies are, and then just shove the uh the the rations that he has down his throat they they taste kind of bland and they taste a bit dry and they feel somewhat unsatisfying but at least for the moment the urge to dive towards the nearest body and start to chomp away at it has has passed uh, make a uh make a perception check for silas and i'll ask uh, Annie and Medrick to make survival rolls. Nine. Okay, you're still too consumed with the process of eating. Six. Annie doesn't also know how to survive, six. and Medrick also doesn't know how to survive. That's okay. Um, Everything gets brought to me, y'all. <laughs> where's my silver platter? Um, well, beer's coming back soon, I guess. So, you kind of... How do you occupy yourself? As you know, it will take a bit of time. Do you do anything in particular? I'll just stare into the flame and 
focus on my connection to Ignis and like repeat to myself, I must not fail. <laughs> Probably have to collect a little bit of, of wood to throw on the fire as it so it'll All right, I'll go do that. That'll keep me distracted. Uh while thinking, I wish Ignis would nuke this site for more of it. It's the only way to be sure. <laughs> I'll probably try to write down in my journal because I have my adventure book with me. Your adventure book? <laughs> I like it. Uh, as you uh, kind of make notes, what sort of things are, is Annie noting? What, what in particular stands out as some of the most important parts she has to capture right now? Um... This would be probably just quick notes of uh, to bring up the under king situation. Uh, no, main, mainly notes about the book, notes about the creature that the the big dude that we just fought, um, and just basically, this is what happened. It was fucking weird. <laughs> okay. All right. Also, we're hungry. <laughs> uh, also, we need to figure out how to get rid of this hunger because, like, I'm hungry. I've never been this hungry in my life. What is going on? Did Silas show the the cube of stone to anyone? Uh, not yet. Okay. Um, Player comment. That's probably the compass. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> Player thinks so. Uh, Silas does not know about the compass. It, it's more of a story angry. timing yeah. element, whether that's something to bring up now or I can bring mm -hmm. up later. That's no problem. Um, no, I think it depends. I, I mean, he might know it's the compass if Marie had mentioned that part of what she'd read, but I don't know nope. if she did. Nope. No, I just read yeah. the last two lines ish. Yep. Yeah. Um, and Silas actually starts to move off into the woods a little bit to get away from the smell. Okay. He's gonna try and control himself that way. Make a survival roll. Nice. Natural twenty. As you manage to put a, a tree between you and the the rest of the bowl and kind of literally block it out, all you can see a little bit of uh, is the light kind of bouncing around the trees. But now at least the main spot of it is is kind of taken out of your view. Um, you slip a little bit on something very slick beneath your feet uh, and look down and find um, relatively fresh uh, scat from the size of it. You're thinking bear, which means that this is a place where bears do roam. And all that meat kind of wafting out from this area is probably going to attract uh, some, some bears if that isn't dealt with at some point. Uh, he leans around the tree and yells back to the camp saying, um, uh, there's bears around here. Uh, we might want to leave as soon as possible. And then got to wait for bear. Tree. What's that? We got to wait for bear. You also kind of realize that you're not even sure which direction to go. You travel for quite a while following the knoll and getting increasingly distracted as you traveled along. You probably can find your way, but you know that Veer knows these woods pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I feel um, much, he doesn't, much more comfortable with waiting for Veer. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't want to leave Veer here. He's just letting everybody else know that there are bears. Uh, and he's going to so stay there look out the for corpses bears. in an area away from here, or like slightly away from here, and Barris can have the corpses, and we can have the deer that Bear brings back. I, I don't think you're going to be able to clean this area up enough for it to not smell like dead things. Yeah, it smells pretty bad. Yeah, but I mean, if the bears go after the dead things, you're not going after us. Sisa so says, I don't know. I don't know bears that well, but there's a big bear turd back here. And uh, so don't uh, let me know when you're done and we're going to head out of here because I'm staying put. At that point, Silas tries to climb the tree. Okay. Make an athletics check. Yeah, that's going to be funny. <laughs> 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 
Wow. Hey. That's two natural 20s in a row. Not bad. My character's always good at climbing things. Um, Your characters are just always good at climbing things. Uh, Amarun was part goat. And because you took some time to eat something, you actually get plus one to that roll. So uh, you managed to sort of scurry up the tree. Um, and you can see kind of handholds uh, easily within reach. Uh, a little bit of scratching on the tree as well, as though you've seen maybe something else also climb this tree a previous time. So it's a good tree for climbing, is what you're thinking. I look up and find the bear. <laughs> and <laughs> tempting, but no, I don't, I don't have drop bears. Um, after about a, a half an hour or so, as you're all kind of trying to figure this out and, and probably consciously trying to avoid looking at the, the bodies, uh, are you doing anything for the two prisoners that were there, or are you just going to leave them on their own? Well, I'll make sure they're stabilized and not dying. Okay. Uh, medicine checks for that. All right. So first for the uh, the woman. Nice. I mean, the guy should be stable because I, I yeah. knocked him out. I didn't kill him. Yeah, the medicine check will also kind of check him over to see where, you know, if he's got any other wounds that would be bad. But yeah, you look her over, and aside from sort of a grimace that's crossed her face and a bit of, of, of twisting and turning, she's actually in relatively good health. Um, yeah. uh, you know, the wounds notwithstanding. In other words, she doesn't have any open bleeding wounds, but she definitely was was sort of taken down to, to nearly dying. Um, for the other guy? Wait, I'm rolling these at disadvantage, aren't I? Uh, yeah, actually, you are, you are yeah. These are oh. skill rolls, and you're still tired. Okay, so the next one, well, for the woman, it was 13, and for okay. the guy, it is. Hold on. Yeah, 23. That's fantastic. 23 possible. is still really good. Yeah, um, again, for her, the, there's no change in what you diagnosed. She's, she's alive, but she's probably not going to be able to walk out here on her own. Um, he's just unconscious. He's got a nasty uh, 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 big egg in the back of his head where he was sort of uh, knocked out. Um, but he doesn't seem to be bleeding. Nothing seems to be broken. He's it, once alive or once awake again, he probably will be able to walk himself out. Um, right. As you look them over too, you, you, you recognize that both of them they are wearing basic leather armor built to move. Um, they've got numerous little pouches across their, their, uh, their belts and across a, 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 a sort of bandolier. Is there food in any of them? Uh, as you go digging through, it doesn't look like to be there any food. There's lots of little survival things. There's a, there's a flint and uh, a stone. There's a or flint and steel. There is uh, a little uh, pocket which looks like snuff, um, probably um, for uh, for consuming for uh, for keeping awake. Actually, um, little things like that. A um, little bit of, of uh, fishing line. A little bit of of uh, a couple of of hooks that can be baited. That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, from that, you kind of de kind of deduce that they were meant to be out here. They're probably hunters. They don't have any bows at the moment or any other sharp weapons, but those might have been taken from them or they might have lost those along the way. Um, and looking at her, you do see her face kind of contorting and twisting. Um, she's not conscious. She's relatively uh, close to death, but she's definitely hungry. Um, he, he seems to be placidly lying there. <laughs> It's just kind of confused. Um, well, I would give her a healing spell if I could access the power of Ignis for this day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but after, as, as I said, about a half an hour, uh, Veer comes uh, trudging back. Um, even despite her size, which actually got to double check on this, yeah, she's moderately strong. Um, she's managed to, to uh, bring down what looks like a small deer. Um, probably a young deer, something that she can actually drag back through the woods. Um, she's tied it up so that it's not bleeding and leaving a trail of blood along the way, um, but brings it back um, to the, uh, and kind of looks at the, the, the still uh, lying there bodies and tries to kind of walk around them, bring it closer to the fire. I was able oh, yeah. to take this down. It will take me a few minutes to dress it. We don't. If we have some stones, we can cook some of it, or stones. green green trees, green branches, to put over the fire. 
I was collecting wood for the for a little while. Okay. Or was I collecting the wrong wood? Um. Uh, Silas says, uh, uh, "Welcome back, Veer. There are bears in the area. We should leave soon." After eating. There are it's many things out though, here. because he's up in a tree. <laughs> there are many things out here. Bears are not uncommon. They will feast well. And her stomach growls. Maybe we should too. Yes, I agree. Um, now she starts to butcher the meat. Is anybody going to help her? Or do anything in that direction? I'll get the fire um, Yeah, I... I mean, I might not be the best at it, but I, I can. I can help. Okay. Um, she seems to uh, uh, welcome it, but at the same time, she still has that standoffishness she's always had. A little nervous about you being there. Um, but after a couple of minutes, she warms up, maybe because it's something she's clearly done many, many times before, and sort of starts to direct you a little bit, almost a, a, a student-teacher moment. Where she's, I accept she's, this. She's sort of I'd go uh, with it. pointing this, you know, we put the knife here and all you have to do is lean and this will come right apart. Um, and despite the fact that, you know, the hunger is there, you get the impression both for yourself and for herself, this is also somewhat of, of a distraction. The process of doing this is so familiar to her and her talking out loud and, and the process of teaching it to you is a way that she can distract both of you from the ongoing uh, hunger. And even within about 15 minutes, already pieces of meat are starting to be strung over the fire. Um, she's taken a couple of the greener pieces of, of wood, the, the, the thin branches, and, and fashioned a sort of uh, brace on top of the fire uh, and started to lay out uh, meat there. It smells way too good. Like, <laughs> you know, if you've ever been near a barbecue and you like meat, Oh, yeah. It smells very, very good to begin with, but at this particular moment, it is like a feast. It's like, is it, is it, is it, is, is it ready? Is it ready? Is it ready? Is it ready? <laughs> and she keeps cautioning a moment more, a moment more. <laughs> uh, but you can see that she's also salivating. Um, I would like an initiative roll for all of those who are going to try to grab the meat to see who actually gets it. Silas, you can smell the, the, the food cooking. And it, it smells so much better than everything else, but you can choose not to be there. Silas has taken leaves and tree sap and jammed them up his nose. <laughs> it's very so, uncomfortable, but effective. I'm going to make a perception roll at disadvantage. If he fails it, he doesn't notice it. But if he does see it, then yeah, he's going. Okay. All right, disadvantage. Eleven. Uh, the, the, even the process of jamming the leaves and sap up your nose has been distracting enough that you don't uh, don't notice <laughs> it. Although you're starting to wonder if you can smell through your tongue. Um, yeah, my eyes are probably watering from the smoke. A little bit. It's not. It's not like it's a grand conflagration and it covers the entire region. But uh, there's a, there's enough, and the wind but is I, blowing just the right way. I cling to my branch. Uh, or the branch he's sitting on, and he he's going to start looking at the stone box. So depending on how long they eat, he may have an hour to look at it, or he may not. That's okay. entirely up to them. But he's going to focus on that and not the stuff he jammed up his nose or the, the tasty, tasty meat. <laughs> um, I will have you make a uh, wisdom saving throw as the famish does uh, come back to you once more. Um, for uh, Annie, you are the first off the draw. The moment the deer says, this is probably ready, before she's even finished that sentence, um, you've taken the meat, and uh, and it does taste good. It, it's one of those weird things that, you know, the more hungry you are, the better even simple food tastes. But you get the impression it really does taste better. It was fresh. She took care in the way that she, she cut this up. You've seen dishes delivered to your table that were made by chefs who've been renowned across the area, and yet this is somehow more satisfying. It's simple, it's direct, and it's not fancy at all, but it's really satisfying. Um, 
You find your, your stomach growling despite your, your efforts, uh, Silas, but you are going to focus on the, uh, on the box. You can make a perception check or an investigation check, depending on what you, were, or what you feel you're doing more of. As far as the box is concerned, you will have a minus one. Okay, because uh, effectively, if they're eating for an hour, he's going to spend the hour effectively pseudo attuning to it. If it's a, it's the thing where if it's a magic item, he would get to know what it does. If it's not a magic item, then he would know. But okay, um, but yeah, he's it would probably be an arcana check. But uh, yeah, okay, make an arcana check. Twenty-three. Nice. He's really focused. Um, did that not show up in the in the roller, or did it? Oh yeah, yeah, it's there. Oh, Twenty-three. Just showed up oh, there it, is. It's, it was weirdly delayed. Lag. All right. I know that uh, roll twenty was did crash yesterday, and it was kind of messy when we played with it last night. So uh, I did just get a message that I've been disconnected for a little, little while, so that may have also been. Uh, a contributing factor. All right. As you spend time, uh, as the others are gorging themselves, and very quickly more meat is put on the fire, so uh, each of Annie, Medrick, and Veer all get a chance to eat something. There's a bit of a moan from the uh, the the two uh, prisoners. You get the impression that in their in their sleeping uh, state, they're still smelling it. And you can kind of imagine that at the moment, being unconscious, they're in a dreamlike state. And what they're dreaming, smelling this food and feeling in that state, is concerning. Um, I'll bring a piece and like put it next to their mouths to see what happens. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, each time you do that, they, they kind of react almost instinctively and, and chomp at whatever it is. Um, pulling the piece of meat practically out of your mouth. Um, the the man actually blinks his eyes awake when sort of getting a bit of food and, and, and looks up at you. His hey, eyes we got wide a barbecue. and not really recognizing you at the moment. Um, he seems really confused. Silas. As you spend the time kind of focusing on this, despite the growing and gnawing hunger in your stomach and looking at this box, this strange uh, cube of stone, it seems seamless and aside from the marking on the top, could be mistaken for, for a raw piece of, of stone that's been shaped but not uh, put to purpose. Um, you start to feel a pull of magic, but not from the direction you expected it coming from. While the, the pull of magic seems to uh, emanate a little bit from the box, you feel it more strongly coming from the ring in your pocket. Mm. Then we'll start checking out the ring instead. Okay. Mm. He might start gnawing at the corner of the box, too. <laughs> Um, more likely to break a tooth than actually crack through the edge of it. Oh no, he's becoming a cat. <laughs> he's cleaning his teeth. By oh, a toddler. <laughs> uh, as, as, the, as the words that were written in the book uh, start to reflect back as you kind of, huh, the, the writer did say something about being changed. Um, maybe becoming a cat. Um, as you turn your attention towards the ring um, and you can feel the sort of magical energies reaching out towards you, um, do you accept the uh, the attunement? Uh, let me s I better double check and see how many things he's attuned to, but I think it's only two. Oh, wait, no, it might be three because the spell starring ring sheet. Where's my... Okay, that doesn't tell me anything. Uh, okay, he's attuned to the staff. Uh, he's attuned to the crown. He's attuned to the spell starring ring. So he can't actually attune to it. He's just trying to determine what it does, I guess. Okay. Um, you can feel the energies pushing in, but you also feel your, your sort of magical corporeal self uh, resisting it. Um, and you feel like to learn more, you'd need to actually attune to it, which means you're moving something you have already. 
Meanwhile, okay. the feast continues down below. The, uh, the the man has woken up and is looking at you, Medric, kind of very, very confused, um, kind of licking his lips after eating this delightful charred piece of, of fresh uh, fresh young deer. And uh, and just sort of hoarsely speaking, what what's going on? Where are we? What, what happened? Where are they? And, and he kind of sh looks concerned and, and jumps up. I think you're muted, uh, uh, Nax. Sorry, the dog was barking. Oh, <laughs> Freaking <okay>. hyenas. <laughs> There's more over here. There was a fight. There was a large monster. We're hurt, but we won. And it kind of. And now we're eating. He looks around and you follow his gaze as it kind of pops between, you know, there's more over here. So he looks over towards the fire and you, clearly the interest, a little bit of smell, he's recognizing that and he starts to move in that direction. Then he starts looking and, and his eye kind of travels over some of the, the dead knolls and he's looking a little bit curiously in that direction. And as he kind of glances around, he looks back towards the woman and you see him he's torn. Alive. You see him torn in that way of, I need to help her, but that smelled really good. And he doesn't seem to be able to make that, to break that, that uh, difference at the moment. She is alive. I'm thinking she'll survive if we can all get out of here. I can help her tomorrow. Yeah. I have no power left whatsoever right now. He kind of leans down and, and uh, brushes her hair away from her face. Very tenderly. Uh, we should... We should... Why am I so We should hungry? eat and go. Some kind of curse. We were affected too. It's a pain in the butt. We, uh... I need to eat something. And he kind of starts to crawl and then sort of steps up and walks over to the fire. And there's that sort of reaches out. Ow. It's Here, let me grab that hot. pot. <laughs> no, I'll grab him a piece. Yeah. Um, it's still slightly on fire. And you hand it to him. And gingerly <laughs> takes it from you. Um, still kind of blowing on it. Still kind of doing that dance of between two fingers, between two hands. <laughs> Uh, and then bites on it, and there's that sort of whole body reaction to, this tastes really good, but oh my god, that's hot. Um, <laughs> and there's that sort of, like, ah, 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 fighting to, to eat the thing. But eventually it cools enough, and he, he eats enough of it, um, that he kind of takes a deep breath. That was really good. Uh, my name is Mason. Um, Hi, I'm Medrick, and this is Vera. She got the deer for us. Thank you. That's Valea, my wife. Uh, there were gnolls. Uh, they're they're dead. I've never yes. seen yeah. them. Like away. Sorry for knocking you out. By the way, you were kind of starting to like nip at us. There's a double take, and kind of like, you did what? I did what? We did what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I. I couldn't help it. Yeah, we know. They were trying to feed you guys dead body parts. What was that about? Honestly, I don't really know. I couldn't really think of much else other than Valea and eating. We were out here hunting and they just came upon us out of nowhere. It's not uncommon to find gnolls out this way, but usually they're more timid. They, they, they're carrion eaters. They'll be around if you leave anything out. And occasionally we do leave things out. feel bad for them, but, but not these ones. These were vicious. There was, was this that? creature called the Laughing One in the cave. We uh, dealt with him. And he kind of looks around. It, it's gone. Yeah, it's that yep. big thing over the, or no, it disappeared, never mind. Yeah. Veer speaks up. Have you seen lights here in the woods? And Mason kind of slowly nods. 
a few nights ago, there were some very strange multiple color lights, bright. It seemed to be always just over over the hill, farther than where we were going to be going. I figured it was probably a fire maybe or something fell from the sky. It happens on occasion. Something falling from the sky? Where? Well, we didn't see anything fall, but it's one of the few reasons that there might be a fire out here. Hasn't happened for a while, as I recall, but Are we, are we are we going to leave or are we going to stay? It's going to be dark soon. Silas says there's bears. They might be attracted to all the dead things around us. So hey, we... Silas, do you want barbecue? Otherwise, I'm finishing it. You have one minute. <laughs> you hear... You hear some sounds from the trees, but nothing is clear. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, Silas does not show up. I count to 60. Veer looks over concerned. Uh, is your friend still all right? This, this hunger is so strong. He should eat something. He should. I thought it would go away when we killed the laughing one, but now we have to find a way to get rid of it. It Maybe feels it like... Nice. It feels like a poison. But not like any poison I know. What was that thing? Where did it come from? I don't know, but... Yeah. Annie, you said something about a door in the journal? Yeah, there was a journal talking about a, a weird door that worlds and that uh, things that were not allies were coming through. All their allies were lost. I'll kind of uh, lean over towards Annie and whisper... I don't know if it's just me, but uh, the fact that Silas is hell-bent on opening this door does not sit well with me. <laughs> Neither for me. There's a door? What kind of a door? It just says door. Not one door, many doors. Where there was. Any can make a, uh, an insight check. Twelve. Okay. Veer seems interested in this. They found a door Maybe. out here. An opening? Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's just mentioned. They don't have any more information than that. I wonder if that's what's connected to the, the lights. It's a possible. possibility. If that's so, then the door is still open. What, what do you mean there's a door in the woods? What, what does that actually mean? Like a, a, a building? Like a, a cabin or something? It seems more like a door to another dimension, or another plane. Like a portal. And Mason kind of looks at you and trying, kind of does a double take at the meat, kind of wondering if it was something in it. A door to another dimension. Well, I've never seen anything like that. Nor have Me I. Neither. But do you remember when we walked in here, it felt like nature and the sun had been changed somehow and when the laughing one died the sun and nature came back i'm, I'm wondering if that door closed it is not different from the hunger 
It is as though the hunger, like a poison that rolled across this land, I would like to find where this door is. If it is still open, that may explain some of the things that we have seen roaming. Large creatures that do not belong here. Now That's we're talking. Good. Large creatures. That would be a lot of fun. Oh, God, I hope so. <laughs> and you can see him kind of grabbing his stomach. Oh. Crap, there's there's no more. And he looks over at uh at uh his wife. Is 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 she gonna be alright? She will be. We have to get her out of here when we leave though. Uh Vera, you can get us back to the camp, yes. And Vera kind of looks around. And you kind of get this idea that she's gauging the trees and gauging this area. I think so. This still feels changed somehow. Um, it is as though... It is as though a fire went through here. The landscape has changed and somewhat unfamiliar, but... When I was hunting, I saw some more landmarks. If I do, if I were to gr climb a tree, I would see the mountains and know. And she proceeds to walk over towards a, a, another tree, not the same one that Silas happens to be uh, climbing at the, or, uh, in sitting in the moment. What is Silas up to as he as he uh, sort of contemplates this magical mystery? Mm. Well, he puts the ring away. We'll have to try checking that out at some point later. Did he at least get a feeling of what kind of magic it was? Like, was it protection magic? Um, elemental? Not really, because he didn't actually attune to it. It doesn't have things like detect magic or, or um, um, uh, identify. But I will say that, um, what was your, your uh, role on that too, by the way? 23. 23? I will say that the, the one thing you did notice was that when you brought out the ring and kind of was exa were examining it and then decided to put it back into your pocket, there was almost a magical pull towards the stone, towards the, the, uh, the stone box, um, mm. as if it was, was inclined towards it or connected somehow. Um, but the, the magic is complex. He doesn't feel as though it is it is a singular magic, but rather um, a, a conduit of complex effect. Sure. Uh, he'll just, uh, he'll probably study the box a little bit more and then put it in his backpack. Okay. As you examine it closely and, and take a bit of time, even though the, the light is, is waning somewhat, somewhat um, make a perception check. Twelve. Okay. The surface is very, very well made. It, it's uh, it's cleaned and buffed and very, very smooth. But as you run your fingers across it, you do detect what might be a seam. It's almost impossible to see, and you really only get it from the barest of, of fingernails dragging across the surface. But... It does seem as though this is a box that can open, but there's no sign of hinges. There's no sign of a locking mechanism. It it resists uh, any attempt to kind of just wrench it open. It feels like one stone when you're handling it. Okay. He'll put that aside for later because he's not. He knows he's not thinking straight. <laughs> He'll study later. Um, Veer goes and climbs another tree. Uh, Mason kind of gestures towards the the bodies. Uh, I don't know exactly what was happening here. If it's a poison, like Veer, that was her name, like she was suggesting. Um, 
I, I don't know about leaving these things here for other animals to eat. If they get poisoned too, it could be really bad. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. I mean, we've got the, the wherewithal to, to try not to or to find something else to eat, but if, if an animal gets poisoned with these bodies, these, these dead, dead things, and then bites another animal, would they be poisoned too? I've heard it's of some possible. diseases spreading that way. Maybe it's more like a disease than poison. I don't know. I mean, we could pile all the bodies into that cave and light a fire light in the cave. Contain the fire into the cave and then so it doesn't spread to the rest of the forest. Right, right. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we can probably get started on that. And I don't know if Valet is going to be able to walk out of here. It looks like a couple of her bones might be not sitting straight. And you can see him kind of grimace and almost, you know, his stomach turns a little bit thinking about her that badly off. Uh, can we still have the ropes? If we can find like a tree trunk or something or like a piece of large piece of tree bark, we can lay her down on it. And I can drag it across the forest floor. Yeah, I can do that. And Mason kind of swiftly moves away from the talk of moving dead bodies to go find trees to help his his uh, his injured <laughs> wife. May have also been a convenient dodge. You're not really sure. I mean, works out. Yeah, I guess checks out. And I'll start. I'll start piling bodies into the cave. Okay. Make a wisdom saving throw. As you pile the bodies. Oh no! But I just ate. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can. I'll feel go that find of... wood to pile in. Okay. Um, so leaving Medric to do all the dirty work. <laughs> I can't lift things. <laughs> I'll break a nail. I'll break a... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as you start to drag them in, Medric, it, it it's. By kind of concentrating on the warm food that's still within your stomach, you're able to divert yourself from, from paying attention to the flesh that's in front of you. But you do kind of get the impression that it's almost taunting you. It's almost as though it's not just that you are hungry and you feel this constant hunger, but that the bodies themselves are almost wanting you to eat them, wanting you to take a bite. And you kind of get this sense, this this feeling almost that that was the plan. They weren't necessarily to survive. They were to sacrifice themselves to spread this further. And when you start to think back as you're dragging the bodies in and piling among them with many stones inside. And that's why they were trying to feed body parts to Mason and uh, Alea. Okay. But you also start to, th to think back on how, how passive that gigantic, dangerous thing was. How unconcerned it was by being swarmed by you. About how it almost held its arms out for you to bite. Well, yeah, yeah, Mason had a good point about maybe this is how this spreads then. But I'll slap the corpse in the face for good measure. <laughs> it wakes up. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it, it doesn't <laughs> no react. But it feels sort of satisfying for that moment to, to make one last uh, mess. Uh, even if you do end up with this sort of thick sludge on your hands from handling these bodies. Veer comes down from the tree, seeing nobody but you there, kind of walks up to you, Medric. I can see the mountain. I've got my bearings. I know how to make it back to the to the camp, if that's where we're going still. Yes. Or wherever we agreed to meet, but I, I feel like we need to rest sooner rather than later. It's closer than the town. All right, let's go to the camp then. And she helps you to drag the bodies in. Annie, you're hopefully finding some dry wood to throw in one tiny little After I'm done with the time. bodies, I'll cast Produce Flame from my hands to burn off all the germs. Okay. 
I don't know if there was a germ theory back then, but there is now. <laughs> Magical germ theory? Yeah. It burns um, the smell off. Anyway. You can hear them, Silas, that they're they're kind of doing a lot of activity down below. You can hear Annie and Mason both uh, gathering sticks for different reasons around you. Should we possibly dig a little bit of a trench at the opening of the cave just so that the fire doesn't spread to the grass? Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm going to look at Veer to make sure she notices me like saying this so she doesn't think I'm an asshole anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Approve of me, senpai. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was sorry. I can make sure that the fire does not spread. But it's better if I don't have to use more power for the day. The more that I can keep in reserve for the dangers that are to still come, the better. Yes, I agree. So I'll start digging a bit of a trench then. Let's see, what does she still have left? More than I do. <laughs> yeah, she hasn't used a lot of spells today, but you know major spells needed to put in forest fires. I will let them know that you are coming, that we are coming. And she uh, puts her hands together and makes a, a a bird sound with her hands. And a small little brown bird comes and lands on her uh, her finger, her outstretched hand. Um, she leans in towards it, whispers to it. Um, in Elven, I think, Annie, you know Elven. I'm not sure if Medric does. Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. I don't think so. Um, she does know that you know Elvin because you caught it before. Um, and you kind of get the sense that she chooses her words carefully. But she tells the little bird to find uh, Gald, to tell him that we are, are well, to tell him that we have um, found the the source of the knoll problem and maybe the source of the door, or not the source, the source of the light, I should say. And she lets the bird go off and fly off, uh, from what you can tell, off to sort of the east from here. Well, let's get this thing lit up. Okay. Uh, it Produce doesn't take flame. too long. Produce flame is the perfect avenue for this. The woods. Fireball. Uh, <laughs> Fireball would actually work very well in this case in a self-contained oh, handwriting. Um, but I'm assuming Medric has taken a little bit more care in <laughs> in this particular fire that he's starting, uh, as previously I mentioned as well. Uh, Mason has has sort of uh, found a number of, of pieces of wood to kind of stretch and make into a stretcher. Um, if you offer the rope, he'll actually use the rope to to bind it together. He does yeah, so well, you know, you kind of get the impression that while this may not be the specific thing he's made before, he knows how to work with, with uh, wooden stone, or wooden uh, rope, I should say. When does Silas come down in all of this? When they're heading out to leave. <laughs> okay. So Other nobody's that, heard he's anything playing, from... He's playing squirrel up in the tree. Okay. Nobody's heard and anything Silas from Silas like that then one dude who, like, just disappears while we're loading up the car coming back from a trip and then just reappears as soon as we're done. <laughs> yeah. I'm not having are, any part in this Tetris. <laughs> are there any nuts in the tree actually? Um make a survival check. There's one. Yeah. <laughs> are there any edible nuts in the tree? <laughs> uh seven. You find some pine cones. They're probably edible if you're careful. He will certainly try. They are not edible. Even if you're careful. Uh, they taste like the stuff I stuffed up my nose. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> All they really succeed in doing is sort of scratching the inside of your mouth. Uh, and making your tongue feel a little bit weirdly numb. Gummy. He's not hard to see in the tree. Why he's being so reclusive to himself, why he's separated himself. You know that the hunger has struck him very strongly. Maybe it's that reason. Maybe it's Maybelline. But for whatever reason, he's in the tree. <laughs> and as you announce, and the fire burns, and the thick smoke 
that you probably stand far away from because you can smell the sort of greasy smell of the bodies being burned. And Mason makes a point about, you know, some diseases can be airborne from fire and stuff. And he steps back a few more feet and also probably the rest of you step back a few more feet from, from yeah. this, the smoke. Um, I, will, I have a feeling your first, uh, your first theory might've been right about this disease being spread by eating, but uh, I hope this, I hope this one is wrong. I Considering so that we did kind of scatter the other corpses from earlier. And you also remember that there was at least two gnolls that got away. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, but after the, the burnout in the hole, the bodies are sufficiently uh, charred up. Um, Veer actually uh, suggests that you grab some of the larger stones and kind of block up the area. Also Other good. wolves and things will come for this as a as a cave to live in. We must dissuade them. But after a while, that seems to be done. A sort of tomb has been created for these dead and hungry gnolls. We should get going quickly, Vera announces, and starts to head off in a particular direction. I Not figure, like, uh, with Medrick and Mason, like, each, like, both helping drag the stretcher, we can be more efficient. Yeah, you can actually carry it, uh, one at each end. Okay. Um, you do see that uh, Vilia is sort of twisting on the stretcher and involuntarily grabbing her stomach. Whatever dreams she might be having in her half half living estate are probably pretty torturous and very, very hungry making. Barbecue. Yeah. Silas comes down, down from the tree. Mm-hmm. Silas, we're leaving. Get your butt over here. He looks ridiculous. Uh, yeah, he's got stuff stuck up his nose, which I'm not going to do. <laughs> you missed out, man. But he's kind of talking like this. Um, yeah, the, the nothing left but the sort of blood remaining on the on the grass that's around here of the bodies. The fire itself, uh, Vilia has made sure has has both been put out. The small fire and the campfire have both been put out, and she leads you off into the woods. Um, an hour passes it doesn't feel like you've gone any less deep into the woods but Vilea seems to have a very confident stride going forward Veer? you mean Veer? Uh, sorry Veer yeah Vilea doesn't have any stride at all she's currently completely unconscious still <laughs> um, but that does mean that all of you have to make another wisdom saving throw sorry actually at this point only uh, only Silas has to. Uh-huh. Uh, shoot, where am I? There we go. As for the others, your hunger level has dropped a level. Ooh, I'm not hungry That's anymore. Holy level. shit. So those who are hungry are no longer hungry. Those who are hangry are just hungry. Um, those who are famished, unfortunately... Yeah, I got a 12. Uh, I don't think it's high enough. Oh, you have advantage on that. Oh, that's good. Yeah, because it's magic. <laughs> that's good. Natural one would have sucked. <laughs> that was, I was, I was very worried about that. Um, yes, no, you find yourself compelled to eat. Um, you no longer have any rations. There's no food left over. What do you do? You know what, deer? That, that deer really hit the spot. Thanks. Silas starts chewing on Medrick's shoulder. <laughs> Does he really, though? Nope. <laughs> uh, he imagines it for a moment. Silas will be look. Silas will be looking around for any animals he can see, and then he'll remember he doesn't have a ranged attack spell. <laughs> well, he does have one actually. There's one left in the ring. So yeah, if he sees an if he sees a small animal. Uh, then he will be uh, attempted to, uh, or he will be tempted to uh, nail it with a spell. Okay. You do spot a squirrel uh, kind of climbing and hopping between trees, kind of keeping pace with you, um, watching and waiting, perhaps. 
Okay, let me just check this. Oh, it's already open to. Hmm. It's not going to explode the squirrel, though, is it? Uh, 47 eh, points of might. damage. I think the squirrel and all of its descendants are now gone. It's like hitting a partridge with a 12 gauge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, how far away is it? About uh, 30 feet. Okay. Uh, Silas is going to cast Catapult out of the ring. <laughs> okay. Squirrel Catapult! <laughs> now, I wish I could use it on the squirrel, uh, but it says choose one object, which uh, a squirrel I don't believe would count as. Not um, yet. If it's dead, it will be, but... Uh... Yeah. Uh, so just any rock or anything, small branch nearby. It can be up to five pounds in weight. Uh, yeah, there are several small stones that are around. Uh, flies in a straight line up to 90 feet. Uh, let's see, uh, before it... Uh, okay, yeah, basically it flies at 90 feet in a straight line. If it would strike a creature, which is what he's aiming to do, that creature must make a dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, it takes 3d8 uh, bludgeoning damage. Okay, uh, let's make this a... Uh, I'll use the cat stats, because they're it's a different size, but it's about the same. Mm -hmm. Very large. Works. They have, yeah. Uh, rolls a 10. I believe that's a hit. It, he, it was a 10 total? Yep. Uh, yeah, my spell save is 13, I think. Okay, you strike so, it. So, yes. How much damage do you do? Let's see. 3d8 bludgeoning. And I kind of want to. I believe a cat that... has one hit point. <laughs> Two, actually. Uh, Two? As, as, I rolled uh, crappy damage, but still more than two. Yeah, actually, you, you, your minimum damage would have been three. So, uh -huh. <laughs> um, so I kind of like to imagine that with this spell, there's that sort of thunk as the uh, the rock gets launched up into the into the sky, and then as it as yeah. the, the, the the squirrel gets nailed. They probably see the rock go up, and then Silas' eyes is, are chasing its trajectory, and then shunk. As the, uh, and the Silas is, like scurries over. Yes, the, 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 the squirrel is kind of pasted against the rock, and then can, this rock continues to fly at 60 feet. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Silas is going to have to chase after the rock to get the squirrel, probably. Okay. Make a uh, perception check as you go searching through the somewhat dimming light for a particular rock with a uh, squirrel covered rock. Seven. You're starting to lag behind a little bit, but you do find it. Um, it is um, tenderized. <laughs> but there yes. are still some chunks of meat on it. Just trying to remember if there's some way that he can make flame. I don't think there is. Well, you could always just bring it back and I can cast a flame on it. That's actually what he'll do. He'll bring it back on a big leaf. Okay. And as though there's nothing wrong, although you can tell from the way his eyes are twitching that something is definitely wrong, uh, he will present it to you and say, could you please cook this, yeah, Master sure. Chef Medrick? And there's a, there's a, you know, while he would try to present himself as, as calm and collective, his hand is shaking, his eyes are darting and looking at this, his, he's licking his lips, he's, he's definitely uh, intent on this um, squirrel pancake. Uh, and there's yeah. also a little bit of like uh, finding Nemo Pelican. Uh, mine, 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 mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll grab like a flat rock and yeah. somewhere. Okay. Is, yep. is there a rock lucky by? Or... Sure. Okay, I'll, I'll pick up a flat rock. Like gently move the squirrel remains over the flat rock and like light a fire under the flat rock. Okay. So that way the leaf doesn't catch fire and everything just doesn't fall to the ground. All right. So I kind of imagine that you're the burner underneath the uh, yeah. the the stone uh, uh, pan, essentially. Pretty much. Uh, and you can hear the the, uh, the squirrel bit starting to sizzle on the other side. Um, Silas, it's starting to smell really, really good. This is going to take forever. This is good. Silas will grab it and start pulling meat off the leg bones or whatever it is that you do with a squirrel. Uh, he probably yeah, it, gets burned a little. 
it, it, yeah, you take one hit point of damage <laughs> as you as you send your fingers on this this slightly oh, I, burning squirrel. I hope you take more than one. Um, <laughs> you didn't have during a lot, that. But, uh, I get six. I mean, we were there for like an I hour. So yeah, I, I was gonna say a short a short rest would be. Rest. A short rest would be fine, so might want to might want to do that just to, so you don't die from no hit dice slightly left, roasted so squirrel. I'm gonna be four. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure Silas was in the same uh, boat. He didn't have any hit dice left. Okay, well, if you are at one hit point, I'm not gonna take your last hit point for a funny joke about a half burning. Squirrel. Oh no, no, he had six. Okay, now he's got five. <laughs> Um, but for the moment, it does seem to satisfy. Up to that point, you were starting to get uh, an extreme version of tunnel vision where nothing outside of getting this to be eaten was making any sense to you. Even as you're eating it, you kind of feel the sensation that it's not quite entirely cooked, but you kind of put that aside and, and, and focus on the nicer parts, which are probably the burned leaves that make a little bit more flavor in this, this uh, oh, part, strange... There's part of his brain that's going... This is too cooked. <laughs> but for the moment, uh, and you, you see that's undercooked, but uh... <laughs> this has kind of slowed the group down a little bit. And and uh, and because, of course, Mason can't drag the thing very well on his own anyway. Uh, but Mason is looking increasingly concerned um, and and kind of like we need to get out of here. I agree. Yes. You are right. Uh, Silas attempts to uh, Silas attempts to straighten up his clothes a bit, and still looking mad as a hatter, says, "I feel much better. I thought I was going crazy for a minute, and <laughs> well, then uh, feel better." And it's like, "Yes, we should walk," and he starts walking in the wrong direction because he has no knowledge of survival, and he's paying a lot of attention to the squirrel. I like but grab he, the back of his like sword as he's turning and turn him around and push. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Um, as you move further on, Veer starts to lead you once more. Um, at one point, uh, another 10 or 15 minutes down, she's been leading you through this direction that for the rest of you doesn't really feel any different than any other direction. Uh, Mason looks around every once in a while and you can see him kind of nod as he seems to be picking out something that looks kind of familiar. There's a tree with three branches uh, out, you know, that kind of form this this weird three-fingered uh, hand. And he kind of looks at that. Okay, I know where that is. I know what this is. And you can see him growing a little more calm, even though he looks back every once in a while at the sort of his squirming wife who lets out a little bit of a moan from time to time as clearly the hunger is is very strong for her. Uh, but Veer stops very suddenly and then uh, holds her hand up. Quiet, everyone. And you're all hopefully quiet for the moment. Yep, I stay quiet. And she points off the trail, essentially. There. Do you see the lights? And sure lights? enough, glowing <sighs> some distance off, there are bright lights. They seem to be lavender and purple and pink and yellow and multiple colors of streams of light that sort of appear for a moment and then almost as though they're partially obscured or directed in another direction vanish it's got to be at least a couple of hundred feet away um, maybe even more it's difficult to tell direction in this particular space Silas does some quick mental math and says there are four lights <laughs> I think there may be more. And in Are a couple of seconds, no. <laughs> in a couple of seconds, the lights go dim. That's. Are those dangerous? Well, that's what I was saying. We've seen that a couple of times, but they disappear like, I guess, not fire. And Veer looks clearly torn. She starts to lean and, and step a couple of steps in the direction of where the lights were. We can't Sorry. do anything right now here. We've already pushed ourselves very far to deal with this situation. We need rest before we can deal with anything else. And if the lights are gone, it's not there anymore. But we are so close. 
Close we may be. We may Being, not be. It won't. We won't be able to help if we're dead. Yeah, we are close to death. She looks at all three of you, or actually all five of you, technically, um, as if weighing that, as if, do I need them? And finally, she takes a deep breath, kind of sighs. You're right. I will. And she looks around, and this time you get the impression that she's sort of making a mental note of where the trees are. And then walks over to one tree, picks up a, a, uh, a branch which has fallen over, already broken off from some previous, maybe a squirrel falling, who knows. And then takes it and carefully wraps it around uh, a lower branch. And you can actually see that small leaves and flowers are sprouting from this branch as she twists it around and makes a particular shape and symbol out of it. I will be able to find this again. But for now, we should go. Yes. The lights, if the lights have been sighted by multiple people, they'll be back. I don't know, as we might be too. I will be. She says and stalks off towards the forest. Again, not pausing, not waiting, expecting the rest of you to keep up with her. Another 25 minutes or so go, pa go past, and you start to hear the sounds of music. You start to see a little bit of glow through the woods. We are here. And she leads you through the, the edges. You start to see trees which have been uh, cut down. Very, very large, very old trees. The edge of the camp, whose name I've just tried to find, and I just realized rabbit I can't. Something. Rabbit Hollow? Rabbit, rabbit Hollow. Rabbit Hollow, that's it. As uh, you break upon rab the, the Rabbit Hollow camp. Um, it is not a permanent camp. It does appear to be mostly a set of tents, although uh, a, a large wooden um, platform essentially has been uh, erected and is kind of serving as a central point of, uh, of gathering, kind of like a, um, um, kind of like a large gazebo essentially outside, but no, no walls uh, propped up between multiple trees that are there. You can see that there's a, a bit of a of a of a, a a fire going on. People are singing and dancing, carrying on. There's someone. There's a, a few people playing different instruments. There's a, a, a violin that seems to be played, uh, as well as uh, someone playing a drum. Another person playing a flute, um, trying to keep time. The music is rustic. It's probably the nicest way to put it. Um, you can see there some of the people you met before. Um, Dale is. Uh, playing the fiddle. Um, Marta, the very large uh, woman who was kind of somber and quiet, is playing a very tiny flute, or what appears to be kind of a tiny flute. Uh, and no, ex no expression on her face. It's not like she's grooving with the music, but the music is, is strangely uh, delicate and enjoyable. Um, and as you get to the edge of it, uh, Veer um, whistles puts both her fingers in her mouth and whistles loudly. The music goes silent for a second, and then they start coming out towards you. Uh, Gold standing uh, up quickly and running over. Um, comes directly to her. Um, you see that uh, uh, there are about six people there in total. You met uh, Jordy, who was the, the short dwarf, Marta, who was the tall Goliath, and uh, Dale, and then there's a couple of others you don't recognize. Uh, although among them also are the remainders of your crew, uh, whose name I have to find. I know Petrock is one of them. Uh, Petrock, exactly. Uh, where, here we go. Uh, as well as uh, Melora and Stefan and Kara. I don't yeah. think anybody died from that encounter. And the one uh, horse. And one horse, yes. Um, which now you can see is kind of tied up some distance away from the camp. 
they welcome you in. Um, strong hands uh, lift the uh, the uh, the I was going to say cart the um, Vilia in her her uh, her um, wow I'm really running out of words today. Uh, anyway, stretcher. lift her and her body and and uh, and the stretcher yes uh, over to start tending to her. Um, as well as sort of Gauld speaking quietly to Veer in Elven, um, which for a human is a little bit difficult sometimes to say, uh, but they're whispering back and forth. Um, Veer sh shoots an eye over towards Annie and sort of moves Gauld a bit further out of earshot. Um, I have a bad feeling that they're going to go check out those lights. Yeah. Why can't they just wait just, until tomorrow? I just hope that they don't get hurt. Or killed. Going Ooh, out on their own. nothing I can do in my current state. I'll check with the rest of our original caravan party and ask about if the, was the delivery made successfully. Yeah, Kara answers. Yeah, no problem after that problem. They all made jokes the entire way. That was probably the most painful thing. <laughs> Thank you for taking one for the team. Yeah, you look... And she kind of looks at the three of you and like then does a double, tech, double take on Silas in particular. You look terrible. Um, maybe you should sit by the fire. There's some ale. It's also oh. terrible, but after a few drinks, you don't care. That's fair. Yeah, uh, yeah we, we ran into some weird shit in the woods. I'll explain it to you as we sit around the fire and Silas most likely stuffs his face. So oh, that little wonder is like on the inside, like, would drinking ale, like, it counts as consuming something, but like, if somebody gets drunk enough, are they still hungry? I guess we'll find it. <laughs> Silas? Uh, Silas goes over by the fire and lays down. Okay. Um, you can smell a uh, a kind of burbling uh, stew that they have in a pot. What's left of it? Sitting right by the fire. Hmm. He sniffs it. What's in the stew? Um, smells like... Probably partridge, maybe? Some sort of fowl? There's some vegetables that poke up as well. It seems thick and quite dark. Uh, he'll pull a spoon out of his mess kit and start uh, dipping it in and grabbing the bits of meat. Okay. I'm assuming that vegetables aren't that appealing to uh, him at the moment. They're, they seem to be less filling. Um Although you were eating rations before, which are sometimes, you know, hard bread, hard cheese, and, and uh, a little bit of dried meat. Um, but yes, you start to pick out the the, uh, the the slight small chunks of meat in the otherwise relatively uh, uh, thick stew. Um, and you hear oh, some, some explanation as... as uh, as Gauld uh, starts to order some more food to be set out. Um, our friends here are very, very hungry. So let's treat them like welcome guests, shall we? And there's sort of a rousing cheer that goes up, and Dale says, I'll get another keg. We're cursed. I, I don't feel cursed anymore. Fair. Yeah, I I don't feel as, as as like grouchy. Don't feel like hurting people anymore if they get too close to my food, but still really hungry. Here, how do you feel? She looks at you and and there's a sort of the, the jaw gets very tight. I could eat. And looking over at the stew and then trying to look away because Silas is making a bit of a mess. Um, 
there's you know the oh the meat's gone yeah there's a a, a sort of plaster of of the flour water and uh broth on his on his face at the moment for the moment he he seems satisfied though um mason suggests is there something we can give to my wife i don't like the way that she's been twisting and she hasn't woken up um i'll ask around is there any meat we can give her or does anybody know any healing i do but i'll have to wait until tomorrow yeah, unfortunately among this crew um they all point to veer and Veer shakes her head. I cannot today. My energies were towards other things. Well, no, it as in I understand. <laughs> um, if my sister I... were here, she could do it. I am going to like suggest maybe giving her at least some of the broth from the soup. And care and of give her. I'll help. I can do that. I used to take care of my, my grandmother. Kind of the same. I mean, not the same. I mean, it wasn't like she was really ravenously hungry in the woods. It wasn't like that at all. She just didn't. I couldn't. Oh, just help. Couldn't eat on her own. We know. <laughs> her bones had gotten old, I guess. And she um, props up... Uh, Valea's uh, head and slowly starts to feed her some of the stew just in a very simple spoon and uh, Valea responds um, very eagerly um, and Kara kind of has to keep spooning things to her but it does seem to be settling her and she does seem to calm down after a while she's eating an enormous amount of essentially flour, water a little bit of broth and a couple of vegetables that's about all that was left in the stew but they they still do lay, better than nothing. They do yep. lay out another another uh, partridge that they had uh, that was draining essentially that they were going to eat tomorrow, but they decide tonight is the better part of valor. So we will fast forward a little bit unless you have specific scenes or people you want to talk to in here or want to talk about some things to each other. No, I'm I'm good. I just wanted to make sure the caravan had made it made the delivery successfully and gotten back here successfully. Seems to be that, seems to be that, that, that went well. Um, you don't know if the added presence of, uh, Dale and I think Jordy went with them. Um, yeah. or the attack was not aimed at that particular spot or the fact that the Knolls who attacked are not keen to go back to the road just now. But it, seems like, <laughs> it seems like what they were able to deliver went well. Obviously, they yeah. lost about half of the, uh, the stuff they were meant to deliver because it was in the other wagon and that was destroyed. Yeah. My bad. I will point out, like, while everybody's, like, eating and stuff, um, I will point out the fact that if ever they do come across any more uh, creatures, mainly carnivores, that are acting like those gnolls were, to burn them, don't let other animals eat them. That is how this seems to spread. At first, Dale seems to respond as though you're joking, and then when you don't seem to be joking, he kind of has that look across his face of, oh. All right, that sounds so terrifying. Don't, if, if any creatures come acting overly hungry, starved, even though they shouldn't be, uh, or acting off for what they seem to be. Burn them. Don't let any other creature eat their flesh. And I'm assuming Mason would add to that theory. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw with my own eyes uh, at one point, Jordy, kind of with half of, uh, a, or with a piece of, of partridge halfway to his lips, kind of looks down on it. You don't think this thing was looking pretty hungry before we cut it down, do you? <laughs> the rest of them kind of move the food a little bit further away from themselves. Silas looks at them. Do you feel hungrier after eating it? 
I'm always feeling a little hungry, but not more than normal. Silas narrows his eyes at him. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to switch to bitter ale. At least I'm pretty sure that wasn't hungry yesterday. And Dale offers to drink to that and promptly does. Medical they, also are, a they are a jovial bunch. You get the, the sense that they've worked together for a long time. They don't talk much about themselves, except for Dale, who never really shuts up about himself. But every story he tells is contradicting to the previous story he told, so you're never quite sure if anything is actually true. He does turn out to be a fairly good storyteller, but you have no idea if anything he said was actually true or ever happened to anybody. And you actually recognize at least one of the stories he told as a very popular bedtime story, but not the way he told it. It was a lot, um, let's just say that the, the, uh, the wealthy merchant and the uh, widower got up to a lot more in his story than they did in the one that you remember. <laughs> Silas, make another wisdom saving throw. Hey. Natural twenty, which counts for nothing because it's a save, but it's a twenty-four anyway. <laughs> you are woken briefly, at first thinking it was your own hunger pangs that woke you up, but then realizing no, you're you're actually feeling okay. At least relatively okay. I mean, you could eat, but at least you're relatively okay. You don't feel compelled. You do, however, look over and see Vilia kind of rolling back and forth moaning in hunger and you know the feeling that she's going through right now she never really regained consciousness she's just been resting and kind of fighting this but you kind of know instinctively the stage that she's at she must have been much much worse than you well silas takes uh medrick's half chewed hand out of his mouth <laughs> and, uh... never sleeping next to silas again yeah, yeah. are very comfortable sleeping just... together i see and the middle of the night, just pat, pats Medrick on the shoulder saying, thanks, man. I'm, I'm good now. <laughs> uh, I'll be right back. I'm just going to run to the washroom. Uh, Silas will go over to Vilia and try to comfort her with um, uh, this one's equivalent to like, go to sleep. Blah, blah, blah. I, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, try to uh, calm her down in her dreaming. Okay, make a performance check. If that fails to work, he'll grab the staff and command her to sleep. <laughs> I uh, I'm sure sorry, make a white check. Uh, it's lots of parents who would love to have that staff. Um, it will be a performance check. Yeah. There you go. Wow. Pair of ones. Oh, I wake her up. Well, she's awake now. Um, yeah, as you're trying to 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 remember the words to the lullaby, and you're kind something, of like, something. that's that's not right. That's not it. Um, you hear her voice from beneath you say, "I think it was a tree that comes next." And she looks up at you very weakly. Uh, do we have anything left from food? There's still some bread and cheese. Nothing else no. prepared for food, for meats. Sure, I'll bring that over and uh, offer it to her. Say, here, you need to, I know it's not meat, but you need to eat something. It'll help you get past this. And she kind of takes it with both hands, surprising herself as well. You can see her eyes go wide. As she uh, she uh, uh, engulfs it. He'll rush over and gets like grab someone's wa uh, water canteen as well because eating that much bread, she's gonna need water. Probably. You hear a familiar oh. voice, not far away. Seems like it might even be ten feet away sitting on a stump. 
Mortals are so fragile, aren't they? It is the voice of the mother. And you see her there, sitting casually, watching what's what's happening. Silas looks over surprised, uh, and will uh, he'll uh, pat Billy on the uh, the uh, shoulder and says, "Just try to rest." She kind of nods, oblivious to everything except for the the bread that she's still sort of shoving handfuls into her mouth. Uh, and then uh, Silas will go over to the the tree stump. You said, "Yep." And uh, he'll sit on the ground next to it. Well, we are what we are. But you can be so much more. As you are, as your family is. Yeah, some achieve that. Some have other paths. They're not all blessed by you, mother. And he'll pull out the ring in the box. There is something strange about this place. I felt it for a while, but I I didn't know exactly what it was. It is though the distance between us is reduced. I think we saw portals, gates, maybe. We saw lights, but I think it has, it might have something to do with this box and this ring. And actually, I, sorry, one thing he would do is uh, he'd unattune, or he would have unattuned to the circlet. Because uh, he's probably not going to see any giant fish that he can communicate with. Just then, giant fish fall yeah. from the sky. It's like, oh, that's the only way you can contact Mother Hydra. Oh, dang it. Mm -hmm. um, Her voice does disappear. Hmm. Well, the end of tuning, I was thinking he would have done earlier before mm -hmm. he went to sleep. But it, it's almost as though the, the attention paid to something else is starting to already draw attention mm -hmm. away from that. Make a perception check. Nine. It is a, uh, a brightly lit moonlight night. Marina is, well, I suppose I can actually check the friggin' map. <laughs> I actually have the moon uh, phases. I can tell exactly what it is, which is kind of disturbing. Um, if I remember what day it is, which I think I do, because I have that in my notes. Uh, I believe it is the 12th, just turned into the 12th of Yuri. And... No, oh, actually, it's Marius who's nearly full. Marina's nearly gone. But enough light to see by. Enough light to make out the shapes of the uh, sleeping folks. They've rolled out essentially more mats for people to sleep on. It's not the super comfortable list, but it's fairly warm still and sheltered. And out of the corner of your eye, you're not quite certain of it. But you think you see a flicker of shadow. And then it's gone. Um, he'll stop looking at the objects and look over to where Mother Hydra was and see if she saw that. No response. Well, then he... Uh... I think uh, look over at the staff and say, uh, I'll find a way, Mother. No response, but 
There's a sense of urgent contentment. Uh, then he'll uh, he'll spend an hour studying the ring again and attuning, attuning to it in the middle of the night. Okay. Occasionally snacking on it or whatever he can scrape out of the pot. Valea drops into a, a, a contented sleep after having uh, had the food. Um, you can still see that she's somewhat uncomfortable, but at least now it feels as though um, what had been driving at her for so long has finally been sated for at least a moment. And you focus on the ring. Do I still feel hungry or just, uh, but less hungry? You still feel hungry. Okay. Um, it's you've you've managed to, to keep yourself in control and by nibbling on a little bit you actually kind of maintain that control but the presence of that particular hunger still seems to be there it has not gone away you focus on the ring feeling the magical bonding that happens when a sentient magical creature reaches towards a magical item something imbued with the very weave of the universe and the light seems to catch a little in the gem that's on the face of it. The gem sitting in the, as the pupil for this eye. You feel if you put the ring on now, it will be bonded to you. So I put the ring on. Despite its large size fit for a much wider, much broader hand, it seems to fit your finger snugly. In a moment, there is a strange sort of urge. And you reach towards the box without even thinking about it. It's cursed, isn't it? He was planning to anyways, so he's, he's just going with this action. There's a little bit of residual energy within the ring. You feel like it's not at its, at its full potential, but here at night, it has gained what it could. So one thing you learn about the ring right away, it does have charges, up to three. It regains 1d3 charges at nightfall, not at dawn. Um, one of the other features you learn about the ring right away is you feel as though you are somewhat protected. I will give you the, the handout for this particular ring as well. Yeah. Yep. Um, but it acts as a ring of shielding. You can spend one charge to increase your AC to by plus five until the start of your next turn. Nice. And the Ed bearer is also immune to the effects of magic missile, missile for that same period of time. Basically the shield spell. Yeah. We just need to get one for Medric too, and then we'll all be immune to magic missiles. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as you bring your hand with the ring closer to the edge of the box, you see on the side of the box, not the top where the the uh, embedded symbol is, but in fact on one of the sides. Um, as the ring gets closer to the, um, the side of it, the granite or stone or whatever it is starts to give way into a mirror of the ring itself. And it looks as though the ring would fit within this new indentation. Well, Wonder Twin powers activate. Boom. You press the ring into it. <laughs> There is a small little uh, light that appears from the gem as it comes in contact. You see a seam form around the edges of the box, and it opens up. You also fear, feel the release of that small bit of energy as one charge was released, the one charge it had was released from the ring. It opens to reveal a chamber within, a round object about the size of your palm within, the, within the, the center of it. Now, I will describe the general structure of this as looking like a pocket watch. It is not a pocket watch, but um, it has the same sort of general roundish shape. It has a, uh, a, uh, a thin um, glass, leaded glass covering over the top, has ornate structures made of metal surrounding it, uh, and has a uh, a ring at the top where it could be attached to a chain, although currently no chain sits there. Uh, in the center, I've got to find my notes here just a second. It would be a not watch chain. 
Um, this one like I don't have good. a handout for at the moment, but I will have a handout by next week. No worries. Um, as the, the diagram, I didn't have time to really draw it. And I just realized I'm looking in the wrong place for my notes. There we go. Um, um, it is a round, intricate, palm-sized brass device with inlaid quartz and also the glass. Resembling a pocket watch in style, uh, complete with a spot for a chain, but looks internally like a compass, but with two needles, one large one in the center and the other one smaller and offset. As you kind of examine the device, you realize there are five dials around the edge of the device, each of which have, have different symbols for them, uh, and each of which seem to click a little bit as you turn them. And as you turn each one, you can feel a sort of corresponding click within the very center of the device, as though hidden gears and complica complicated mechanisms are lining up. Um, you feel as though this device itself has additional magics, and that to activate those magics means reaching out to this device as well. Also, you feel as though the only way this device would bind to you is if you were also bound to the ring. Mm, gotcha. Um, but it does indeed resemble some sort of compass when you open up its, its, uh, its, its top. The needle on top begins to swing and sway, but seems not fixed in any particular direction at the moment. The other needle, as you realize, uh, is more or less a singular meter. It does not turn all the way around, but instead has a small post at its uh, leftmost point where the needle is, in fact, uh, stuck at the moment. It does not seem uh. to move from there. Direction and strength, possibly. Hmm. You um, also feel another pull from the ring itself. Off somewhere towards any, perhaps? Hmm. Okay. Um. Well. Huh. Before I check that out, uh, Silas is going to look around the inside of the box, see if there seem to be any sigils or something that uh, maybe of protection or of warding or something that might explain why he... Well, actually, no, I suppose when the compass was magical, he wouldn't have sensed it through the box anyways. Yeah. Um, yeah, and from your magical knowledge, you you sense that the box itself is a protection. Yeah. And it is well, fairly thick. Well, there is that chamber in the center that this was. Uh, the walls themselves are probably a couple of inch thick on each side. Yeah. He'll put the compass back in the box and close that up and pack it away again. Uh, when you close it up, the seam disappears, as does the indentation where the ring had gone. Uh, and then... Does he still have the feeling that's pulling him towards Annie? Yes. He will try to sneak over to Annie, which is not going to be easy. <laughs> okay. Um, and he'll just move his hand over her and see if there's a specific, if it's pulling towards something she's wearing or something. Okay. We'll do with a stealth roll to begin with. Yes, there's a good chance that Annie's going to notice him because he sucks at stealth. I've got a plus one. I got a seven. <laughs> I'm pretty sure her passive perception notices that. Although you're not the most perceptive bunch, I will say, but uh, a seven is pretty bad. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, Annie, what is Annie dreaming of? What kind of dreams would come to mind for Annie after such a weird day? All the different things that might remind her of home or things that she might have flashback stores or is there a peaceful place that Annie goes to in her dreams? Uh, we can't no, hear you, you're Annie. Muted. You're muted. She, she's still kind of hungry. Uh, so she'd probably be dreaming of like a feast. Mm. <laughs> okay. Like, like a big like buffet. Okay. 
all of the yummies. Feast, is it a feast from home or a feast of this area? Where is where where is this located? Oh, it's probably like a, a feast like at the palace. Like okay. a party with like all of the food, like all of the like big like Hogwarts meal table style. <laughs> okay. So it's a proper big old banquet going on and uh Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's kind of weirdly shifting from time to time and you see your, your, uh, your father and your mother, uh, successfully embarrassing both you and your sister, uh, by yep. insisting on dancing, which you, oh. you know, they, <laughs> they do it very, very well, but at the same time, they're getting a little bit too flurried with it. And it feels as though they're really trying to, to show off at this particular point. Um, and you see, um, your uh, governess um, kind of there and winking at you once in a while kind of as in, yep. as in uh, uh, this is going to be you one day you better make sure you're picking, taking notes as she will, would probably say to you more than once um, but then there is weirdly in the middle of all of this sort of stalking along the table dragging his hands every once in a while through the food you see Silas He's just kind of observing it all, but every once in a while just looks back at the food. And he's still kind of stuffing things into his face, very ungainly. And you can see that other others are starting to look towards this strange figure who's there. In fact, you see not only Silas, but this large gray outline surrounding him, taller than him, a feminine outline. He talks about the mother. Maybe that's what you're seeing. And then he grabs a loaf of bread and walks over towards you and proceeds to break the bread in your direction, spilling crumbs all over your face. And you can feel these crumbs falling down on your face. And wait, you're actually feeling crumbs falling down in your face. And your eyes kind of open up as you start to scrabble across your face and realize that Silas, who has his outstretched hand over you, is dropping crumbs of the bread and cheese that he's been eating all night that's stuck on his sleeve onto your face without actually thinking about it. And you look at him kind of leaning over you and you realize, wait a minute, what the hell? <laughs> An arm strike. <laughs> also, his hand is out kind of like, mm. <laughs> but it's a, it, it, it's a couple of feet away from you. He's not that close, but he is close enough to be there. I mean, you're dropping crumbs on me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how does Annie react <laughs> in the story? <laughs> <laughs> apparently. Silas does the same thing. Ah! Uh, and there's there's suddenly noise all around as as you seem to have woken up two or three of the people with your outcries. Um, most of them, Jordy kind of just rolls over and starts snoring again. Uh, uh, Dale kind of opens his eyes, crop, props one eye open, looks at the two of you. No, too much, too much beer. Not getting up yet. Um, Medric, you kind of hear. What are you uh, doing? And he's stressing a little bit as well. You're woken up briefly by this. Sorry, I didn't think you'd wake up. I'm, I'm just kind of listening to get ready to go back to sleep. I've been trained to not let anyone sneak up on me. Why are you trying to sneak up on me? Well, because this ring that he shows you, which, I mean, we're in the darkness, but. Uh, um, this is the first time you've seen this ring. Yes. What's Annie? that? Annie? I got it in the cave. Can you make a history roll for me, Annie? I, I, I can make a history roll for you. Well. You've seen the face of this ring before. Inside the interior cover of the book, there's a very similar uh, symbol with an eye with a gem in the center. But as he's holding That's... it out like this, as he's holding it out in ring form, you realize that you've seen this before, before, without the gem in the center. Off the docks of Ilthvater, one time you sent Graveler out to go digging for treasure, essentially. He came Ooh, back up with a couple right. of curious things, including a ring, yeah. which had an eye on it, a spot for a gem, but no gem was included. Except this one has the gem very clearly. 
I found this in the tunnel. Yeah, that that looks like the gem, the the symbol from the book. What? Why are you wearing? Why didn't you tell us what is going on, Silas? I haven't quite been myself the past half day. Um, Oldest. I was a little food obsessed. I'm still hungry, but it seems to be going away. I think it'll wear off. But um, I woke up. Uh, Vilya was. When Vilya woke up, uh, I gave her some food. Good. And while I was awake, I decided to check the ring out. And I guess it's a ring that will protect me, but it not going to say the ring is attracted to you. <laughs> that would be bad to say right now. Uh, the ring, the ring is pulling me in your direction. I don't know what I'm wondering if it's, if there's something that you're wearing that was connected to it. I remember you have that, that amulet that protects you. I yeah, think but that was this... given to me but from Catherine. Yeah, I think this does kind of the same thing. Um, is there anything similar on, on that? Question to the DM. If, if we like wake up and chat a little bit, does that interfere our long rest? Or with our long no, rest? No, unless you decide to do something really outrageous, like, you know, get into combat or something. Yeah. So it's like a ring of awkwardness. <laughs> like, Sorry, I, I, I didn't mean, I, I mean, I didn't want to wake you up. I, I wasn't trying to take anything. Uh, I just didn't want to wake anyone up because we all need sleep. Uh, but, uh, I mean, we can check it in the morning, but I don't know why it was pulling me in this direction. Unless there's I... something else it's linked to. Maybe they're a set. Now that Annie's awake, you can see what the ring does. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that the book mentions an underking. Which, if it's recent, that means that the dwarves are going to be causing problems. So maybe it has to do with the royal family or something. I don't know. Hmm. Like, or that's the only thing that comes to mind that it would pull you to me specifically. Yeah. Because this, this is no... To, to general, I wouldn't have a random the, the random necklace mm -hmm. on me. It would be in our room. I thought she wore the uh, the protection one. Was it the protection one that? Well, he was. Uh, uh, no, well, there was the the ring that you remembered. That's se uh, separate. I, Where's I, that? Might still have that. Uh, Silas is thinking of the amulet of protection. The brooch of shielding. Uh, yeah, the brooch of shielding. Because he said they seem to do a similar thing. He's wondering if they're linked some way. Uh, no, they, they uh, this was this was given to me by Catherine. It wouldn't, and, and it has like, you know how everything had like a Catherine vibe to it, like the the purpley gemmy thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it it wouldn't be related. The only thing that comes to mind that would be related is that it's in my room, and like I've. I don't know, but I've not heard of two completely random things being connected. Me neither, but I mean, admittedly, this is, it, I don't have a lot of, uh, of stuff like this. Um, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll let you get back to sleep. Uh, I was just awake and something was eating away at my thoughts. Silas? Um, yes? Make a perception check. As you stand near, oh. near, near uh, you want Annie. me to fail another perception check? Sure. Well, I mean, be positive. That's a, that's hey. a double yeah. success. What are you talking about? Pair of seventeens. 
Hey, I got a plus stand, one. I don't see that often. As you stand close to Annie and start to discuss this, and they're sort of gesturing a little bit with the hand, not really thinking much about it, you do feel a difference in that pull. And you feel like you could pinpoint it. But it's not Annie. It's not her directly. Okay. Okay, so, it, but it, it might be something around her? That's what it feels like. Okay. I'm going to see if I can... Like, once he notices that, he'll just... Uh, say, it's, it, it's not you, it's... And yeah, he'll just kind of reach around and just see which way it's trying to tug him. Uh, so trying not to get too jokes. close to Annie, but just uh, trying to focus it in. Right. Uh, yeah. So as you're as you're kind of moving around, and and you see him seem to gesture with this hand and and follow the hand. Weirdly enough, um, it lands upon your bag. Something within the bag. That's. It's Is it trying to here. get? It's not you. I don't know. I like dig through the bag. I'm like the only thing, like the book. I don't know. It has the same symbol. I'm tired, Silas. As you hold out the book, that definitely feels like it is the source of this connection. Oh, that's it. Well, I mean, immediately that makes sense. Look, I'm worried about you. I don't want you going to look for that door. Like, I don't want you to, like, open a crack in the world or something. Like, I know that you have your thing I, with your, like, patron and or whatever, but, like... I don't want to do it. Idea. I don't want to do it dangerously. And it's not something I want to do right now. I want to make sure it's safe. Uh, and if it isn't? Because I... I... If the cult has a proper leader, I think it can do good things. And I... Th I believe that Mother Hydra will go with whoever's the strongest leader of the cult. I th I think I can make it a better thing, but she needs to be here. But I understand that opening up something could be very bad I mean, if we don't know where it's opening it up to. Uh, but I would, if we can find a safe way to do it, I would like to do that. We know there's an empty, there's an emptiness in this world from whatever it was that was removed. And there are things trying to replace whatever was removed. I think it would be better for it to be uh, to be the mother than to be something else that that we don't know about uh, but that's I mean that's not a necessary discussion for now I mean I, I'm not going to go opening I promise really I promise I'll try really hard not to go opening random portals to different places uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think it I think it's something that might be of use in the future to maybe fix the problem that we're having. Kazan said that there's something about this area that is wrong. Not that I don't trust you, but trust the mother. Everything that I I've heard from everyone about everyone else other than you has I been that it's very self-serving, that it not fit to the rest of the community. So I don't think that putting someone who is self-serving in that position a good call or our call to make. Well, Gods. You, we're, who are us humans to mess with it? Well, I think for one, I think that I mean, there are many things out there, I mean, the gods themselves, I mean, look at what Medric has to face anytime he wants to help someone uh, with a spell. Um, and I agree that the mother has not aided the town, for instance, but she has aided the people who follow her. And what uh, happened to your wife? 
I don't know. People who have followed her and had harm caused to them by something that doesn't make sense. That I don't know. I I want to ask my parents about it. They're the last they're the ones that were there. But it's hard to talk about with them. Like I said, while I trust you, I do not trust the mother, and I don't... I understand. I. It's only recently I've started to, to think that the mother may be something really worth fighting for. Um, but, like I said, I, I think that's something that... We need more information for it's not it's not something i want to try right now is there but... anything else that you found in that case hmm pat's gonna have to think on that for a second <laughs> uh, <laughs> involve a deception role <laughs> well because he does want to be truthful with people uh most of the reason he didn't mention it before was because he was uh, he was utterly obsessed and the hunger was kind of driving him in that direction uh, to the other obsession he had. Um, he says, yes. Um, and actually, he's going to tr he's going to see if doing the same thing as he did with the cube works on the book. I'm not giving him the book. Oh, sorry. I thought you'd handed it over to no. him when we were talking about it. No. Nope. The I found a cube in there. It has markings similar to the stuff we'd seen from Catherine. Um. And inside there was a compass. Well, sort of a compass. I think it's for finding portals, but that's just a guess. Uh, I don't really know. I'm wondering if the book might tell us more. I'm trying to be bl very blank faced about that. <laughs> so are you are you uh, trying to to to? I'm trying to your your to not react to that okay. specific thing. So this would be an, in, the... an insight role versus that deception role. Mm -hmm. well, I know it did uh, say that when the portal opened, everybody died or allies were gone. Wow. Oh, I got a 20. Okay. Wow. So, yeah, the stoic Annie is trying to hide something or trying not to react to what you just said. Trying very Silas, hard and consciously look, not to. Silas will look back at her and say, uh, this is the complete truth. What are you hiding? Well, she did read it out loud to us. She didn't read all of it out loud to no, us. Uh, no, she, she only gave a little <laughs> yeah. bit of the, of, the, of the summary of it. I read it out loud to you, but, you know, I'm an omnipotent being in this universe. <laughs> you are the gods. <laughs> there was information about that in the book that is all and I'm not going to say more I don't where you were suddenly attracted to the book don't necessarily trust what's going on I don't think that the book and the ring should be combined. It's gonna happen. We don't know if that's going to. We we don't know if it's going to cause you to just go. And what happened to the previous user? He was a corpse I, in that cave. I don't. I don't think it would. I mean, if they need the compass to find the portal. At the very least, I think you'd have to be at the portal for you to go anywhere. I think the book 
may have something more within it about whatever that guy was doing. Um, Just a point of clarification for Annie. Mm -hmm. I know what you said, but I want to make sure that you're aware or you remember that from especially the later entries in that in the journal, um, the writer he went mad he said also changed and i am changing yeah okay uh, i'm uh, sure uh, you're uh, aware of that uh, i forgot about that so yeah i was like he changed into something lost his mind and is now a corpse in that cave right and some of the fabric then in there was stretched so is it possible that the previous owner of the book turned into the laughing one possibly it's possible he opened a portal to some place and was possessed by some by the thing. Well, that's no laughing matter. Or it's possible he was turned into one of the gnolls. <laughs> the uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, when when we were talking with the gnolls when we first captured them, it sounded like they had been something else before they were gnolls. So maybe part of this process was turning things into gnolls. Maybe, maybe the height, well, for them, it sounded like they were hyenas and that thing turned them into gnolls. So, I mean, there could be some transformative property there. But we're going to have to research this at some point because this is something going on here. I mean, we finished, we took out the laughing one, but then on the way back saw what may have been another portal open. Uh, it hasn't stopped. And I agree with that. I just don't think that right now is it a good, a good time to test that theory. Maybe sure. In the morning. Yes, you I, should go back to sleep. I think we sleep. should. I, th I think we should not rush into anything. And I don't think that giving you this book right now is a good idea. I'm fine with that. I think that it might clarify some stuff for us, but I understand if you want to keep it uh, separate. I do think that it undermines the fact that you said you wanted to trust me. I, I'm not I trust the one you. Here. I don't trust whatever magic this is. I don't understand magic. But also, we currently aren't in... If it, this does currently cause something to happen, we're currently in the middle of a lot of things. Sure. And we're currently not in a position that should this awaken something or open a portal or whatever that we could deal with that sure two in the morning is not a time to do anything nothing good happens yeah. after two in the morning i don't know what you mean <laughs> i'm perfectly fine i've got all my apart my, all my uh, abilities back and with that metric just like rolls over and tries to fall asleep again <laughs> um just remember that i have been truthful to you and you haven't been truthful to me. So Silas will go off and uh, find his bedroll again. And as you walk away, you still feel that connection, that feeling, that sense um, toward, well, what at first you thought was Annie, but now more clearly is the book. And mm. it's not an urgency. It's not a compulsion. It's more of a locator i know where the book yeah. is i know where it is now i know where it is now i still know where it is and after a while as long as, off as, the as, long as it's not reminding me like that no it's over there it's over there it's, it's over more there. Of, i'm trying it's, to it's, sleep it's more of once you you kind of hear a bird singing and it sounds really really distinct but the the 11th time you've heard a bird singing you can kind of pick it up but you can also leave it you can also just let it blend, blend in the background it's that sort of mm. sense it was new it was uh, uh, big in your, your periphery, and now you're aware of it, but you can ignore it. 
Remember that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Silas would just sleep the rest of the night. Annie, mm -hmm. perception check, please. That's persuasion. There we go. <laughs> you persuade the knight. Oh, ouch. Okay. Um, as you're laying down to sleep, something feels weird about the camp, but you can't put your finger on it before you drift into unconsciousness. Oh, Shazbot. Silas Do forgot get... about the shadow. Do and I get to make a perception check? You already went to sleep. You already purposely tried to, to go to sleep. They, they, they were keeping me up with their chatter. <laughs> I'll say make a perception check at this advantage. Okay. I'm still exhausted. I'll be super generous. If you roll a seven, I'll, I'll just have to laugh, though. Thirteen. Okay, thirteen is not a seven. Um, you haven't gotten rid of your exhaustion yet. So you're still... Uh, uh, actually, that's a disadvantage. You're already fine yeah. with that. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem nearly as crowded as the camp, weirdly enough. So you got to... Ah. And with it that, doesn't seem as crowded. it doesn't seem as crowded. You're not sure if everyone is there, but you know, you've had to get up in the middle of the night and go for a, a tinkle behind a tree. So it's probably something like that. And with that, and with a good night's sleep, I think I'll call this evening session to a close. New uh, bombshell dropped off in the middle of everything from some in innocuous loot after having starved um what will the new day bring hopefully it'll bring a nice rest i can tell you right now everybody gets a full night's rest so if you want to go ahead and take care of that now you're welcome to uh and uh, i will say however when silas wakes in the morning he still feels hungry that that still seems to be persistently sticking around um for annie and medrick it seems to have cleared for vilia it seems to have cleared that is all for tonight. Thank you very much to my players for uh, some intriguing stuff. You guys are throwing shade like I haven't seen before. It's great. I love it. Uh, <laughs> digging into the background stuff, also pretty awesome. I love it. Um, very curious to see where things go from here. Uh, and uh, every once in a while, it is kind of fun for me to go, hey, you remember that, that thing 15 sessions ago? Yeah, yeah, I had a thought for that. Yeah, by the way. Uh, for those of you watching at home, if you're watching live on Twitch on Sunday afternoons, 3 o'clock Atlantic time, which is uh, 2 o'clock Eastern time and some other time zones, it's other times. Uh, you can also find us on Twitch. You could actually go back 15 episodes ago and see if I was right in figuring out which episode that actually occurred in. Probably not. Uh, just a spoiler, probably not right because I don't remember them that detailed. But you can watch them all on YouTube, youtube.com slash ENCIF1. I've got a couple of playlists to make it easier for you. If you're looking for campaign one, it's under L-O-T-D-I uh, uh, called, actually, I think it's just called campaign. Well, I should know better than to try to tell you things that I've forgotten. In any case, this one, you can look for L-O-T-D-I, The Great Confusion, and you'll find it there. All the episodes to go and watch and enjoy. That's it for us this week. We will play again next week. Thanks again to my players. Thanks to the, thanks to the DM for running. Did you say thanks, whoever? <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> uh, thanks to Tech, who dropped by in the chat room briefly. And was oh. in and out before I had a chance to say hi. But thanks for Tech for dropping by. That's it for this week. We will see you again next week. And the intrigue will continue, as will probably more jewelry. There's probably more jewelry in your future. See you guys probably next more week. Drama. Yeah, definitely more drama.